the Jesus way. Is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way. Is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When He is King, all wars will cease. May His peace begin with me. I'm gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my sword. Into a plow. Into a plow. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my sword. Into a plow. Into a plow. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Christ is king in my life now. May his peace begin. It was 65 years ago that the youth and the young adults of the Church of the Brethren brought a proposal to the annual conference in Colorado Springs to create a volunteer service program with a purpose that would promote peace, prevent war, and help bring about justice in the world. Today, it's a reality known as Brethren Volunteer Service. Hello, I'm Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. Those original goals are still happening today. And we're going to tell you about one of the volunteers who is serving in Japan. During those 64 years, there have been nearly 8,000 young and older volunteers who have served in this country and in various countries around the world. Through Brethren Volunteer Services, People give their time and their skills to help a world in need. Volunteers work at greater issues than themselves. They recognize that their efforts may not immediately solve deep rooted problems, yet everyone can be part of an ongoing work to advocate for justice, peace, serve human need, and care for God's creation. Volunteers may find themselves in service that focuses on agriculture, housing, healthcare, the environment, in total, over 20 different areas of interest. Right now, we're going to take a look at the BVS website. So let's go to www.brethren.org. When we do that, this is the home page. In the left column, the first listing in the menu bar is service. Under service, the first listing is Brethren Volunteer Service. So let's click on that. This is the Brethren Volunteer Service homepage. And again, in the left-hand column, we can go down to a third listing called Project Listings and click on that. This page allows you to find projects all over the United States by state, and all over the country, all over the world by country. You can also sort by categories. If you sort by categories, in that window, we find all kinds of listings, over 20 projects, types, agricultural, children, disabled people, environment. I thought we'd go down to the prison system, and see what they do. In the prison system listing, BVS has two projects. One in Alderson, West Virginia, called Alderson Hospitality House. They provide lodging, meals, and transportation supporting those who are visiting loved ones in the nearby Federal Women's Prison. The second project is called Good Samaritan Home, and that's in Sydney, Ohio. The Good Samaritan Home offers ex-offenders temporary housing and support when released to the, from the prison. Next, I thought we'd look at Japan and see what they are doing. In Japan, we find two projects. The World Friendship Center in Hiroshima, Japan, which we've highlighted on this program. The second program project is Asian Rural Institute in Tochiki Ken, Japan. That's where Rachel Buller is serving. The Asian Rural Institute is an international training ground for grassroots rural leaders. We recently visited with Rachel Buller from the state of Georgia who is currently serving two years in Japan at the Asian Rural Institute. 
We asked Rachel about her decision to go into BVS and, of all places, to go to Japan. I was really interested in BVS because they had so many different placement options. I really wanted to travel outside of the country because I had done some traveling before and every single time I just really enjoyed it. So I was hoping that I could find some place to volunteer outside the U.S. And also BVS has domestic placement, so I just thought it was a good balance and either way I could probably find something that would interest me. Well actually my first choice was a place in Ireland but they currently had a BVS volunteer there and I also found ARI in the booklet and I was interested because it's also a community um, and there's people from around the world who come here for the training program and so that's been something that's just really important to me is living in a community where there's a lot of diversity and people just sort of an international feel. So um, I thought even if I go to Japan, it will be like I'm also kind of traveling in some ways because there will always be people from around the world there. So that was another thing that really interested me in ARI. And then my roommate in college for almost four years was Japanese, and she really encouraged me to come to Japan also. So those were the maybe primary factors, I guess, in my decision. We ask, what was her first impression of Japan? My first impression, I guess I was kind of comparing it a little bit to China since I've been there also, but um, I liked it. I thought it was also... Um, very clean, I suppose, and um, also fairly urban, of course. I came from a very rural area, so I don't really like cities that much, but um, yeah, there's a lot of big cities in Japan, so that also was something that I noticed. The Asian Rural Institute, known as ARI for short, is an incredible program which has an international flavor dedicated to training grassroots rural leaders from the most marginalized parts of the world, primarily Asia and Africa. Their focus is to facilitate self-development of rural people in organic farming to encourage, assist, and train people and their communities to become self-sustaining and to assist in building peace and justice in the world. We asked Rachel to tell us about it and to describe her typical day. ARI is um, a community that trains rural leaders um, from around the world. And these participants come from all different countries, but generally from Asia and Africa and the Pacific. Um, and they will stay for nine months and participate in the training program. And this program consists of both classroom lectures and also practical lessons, which they actually go out to the fields and practice some of these different farming techniques. And um, so, yeah, as a volunteer, my role is kind of to support the staff and make sure that the training program is running okay, and also to support the participants. So it's kind of an in-between kind of role. <clears throat> but it's one that I think is very important. Basically, it just trains them in leadership skills, community building, um, development, and sustainability. Um, just sort of practices that will um, improve or also just kind of enhance the techniques that they're using so that they become more agriculturally and ecologically sustainable. Life at ARI is very, very busy. We get up every morning at 6.30 for morning exercise, and then the day ends at around 7 o'clock after supper, but that's when we have a lot of free time. In between that, there's um, morning work and also morning gathering, which is kind of a devotions time, and then of course we have lunch and then afternoon work. And then also there are morning and evening food life work. 
And the food life work is basically the whole community involvement in farm work. And so there are different sections. Um, the livestock sections, there's fish and chicken and pig right now. And so in each of those sections, we just um, take care of the livestock and that involves like feeding and cleaning. And then also there are crops and vegetable sections. So in those sections, we are either planting or harvesting or weeding or something that, something that involves those kind of things. So um, those are generally the kind of jobs that we do during food life work. It's six days a week. Um, Sunday is kind of our free day, but then on the weekends we have weekend assignment. So starting from Saturday lunch until Sunday evening, there are different slots and you can just sign up to help in a different section. Meal service is one of them, so of course it's really important to make food for ourselves as well as to take care of the livestock and also the crops and vegetables. So um, basically we just sign up one time during the weekend to do that work. And so that way it's evenly distributed and we can have more free time as well. We're going to visit more with Rachel and take a tour of the project, which covers a large area of property with many different animals, including fish, pigs, <coughs> ducks, How do you like those sounds? But first, here's a message about BBS. This is a world full of options. It's like a never-ending buffet line. While all that I'm really needing is living water and the bread of life. So as I'm walking through BBS provides a stipend each month for the volunteers, and room, is bo room and boarded is also provided. So we ask, how does she spend her money? I think I do end up spending most of it, and I spend it on snacks, because all of the food at ARI is very healthy, it's all organic, and it's delicious. But sometimes I just miss having my own snacks too. Sometimes I get Oreos or chocolate chip cookies, milk tea, which I really like, um, or Dr. Pepper, or something like that. Yeah, if you go to the right stores, um, a lot of the bigger supermarkets will carry those kind of items, but yeah. I haven't explored too much with Japanese snacks yet, but some things I know that I really like, so. Um, it's quite a bit more expensive, I think, yeah. Generally, I've found that the quantities of the food are a lot smaller for the same price. So, um, whereas you might get a package of Oreos that has four rows of cookies inside in the US, it would only have two in Japan, and it would be also shorter. <laughs> Rachel gives us a tour of the Institute, so let's join the tour. It's like these, are these ponds? Were there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one 
We just moved fish into this pond, so we drained all the water out of it, and then we filled it up enough that they could have enough water and oxygen. We just harvested fish, um, I guess, maybe two weeks ago, I think, but... Um, when you mean harvest, you mean you catch them and eat them? Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't... Maybe we didn't eat all of them yet, but um, we butchered them, too. Okay. And um, what kind of fish are they? Common carp. Common carp, not the, not the goldfish koi. No, although they are part goldfish. So that explains also the size. They're not going to get as large as regular carp are. Okay. I have no idea how large carp can get, but I've seen the koi, they can get pretty large. Mm -hmm. So how, when you uh, harvested the fish, how big were they? Um, most of them were about this big. Okay. So they weren't huge either, but. Okay. And the, the, so this is a large tank. It looks like there's two smaller ones here. Yeah, this is another tank here. We also recently cleaned this one. <clears throat> Look at this. They, they, wow. They kind of uh, collect together. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just kind of murky water, but it's uh, no, it's a clean, school of so fish. All of those dark areas are just fish. I never knew that. That's, those are, that's a massive school of fish. Mm -hmm. um, right now it's about 10 degrees Celsius inside um, the pond. And when it's that cold, the fish don't eat. So we don't feed them anything. Um, they just kind of live off of the nutrients in their bodies and they will not eat until the water begins to get warm again, which will be in the spring. So all winter they don't get fed. And they don't eat. Mm -mm. So they kind of hibernate? It'll freeze? Will it freeze over? If it freezes, yeah, they'll just live on the area underneath the ice. So. Well, that's the problem. I just joined this section, so I never got to feed the fish. That was something that I really wanted to learn about. Um, also making the fish pellets, what kind of ingredients go into doing that. But um, I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. That's something that I'm looking forward to next year. So, you have ducks, too? Yes. Mm -hmm. So these are Igamo. Say again. Igamo. Okay. They're a um, mix between wild ducks and also tame domestic ducks. They can't fly. But they could run away. Yeah, they run. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do with the ducks? Um, we just feed them. I think next month they will be six months old, and at that point um, they may start laying eggs. So we will start also collecting eggs when they lay. And, um, yeah, so we just feed every morning and evening. They get both concentrated feed and just fresh vegetables. They really like king kong, which is a leafy vegetable. Um, and then the concentrated feed, they get okara bread, which is a mix of okara and bread, just like the name says. And also they get rice husk charcoal and um, fresh rice also, and that's all just mixed together and then put into their feed trays. They are kept... Um, both for food and also for weeding the rice paddies. So we got them when they were just babies and then we released them to the rice paddies for weeding. So they also control insects and um, yeah, just by walking on the, on the floor of the rice paddy, also they stir up the weeds and the mud and just sort of discourage um, yeah, plants, other plants from growing there. And they don't eat the rice? No, they don't eat the rice, so they're very good for that kind of So it looks like we're at the edge of the Koinonia building. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's where the conference room is. Administrative and office building. We call it the farm shop. Here on the right is all for farm equipment and also egg cleaning. And then this area here and also the second floor is mainly office buildings. You know what is this on the right side? This is just the greenhouse and we keep a lot of, um, well right now there's egoma there and we're drying it and also collecting the seeds. So. Mostly it's just for drying in the winter time, but then in the spring and summer, sometimes we have plants growing there too. On the tour, I was quite fascinated by the pigs and with the knowledge Rachel has acquired about their care. Believe me, the sows were really big. And I was impressed with the information she has gathered about how they are raised. Are these, uh, you know, are they, you know how many, it looks like they're different sizes. Yeah, they're all from the same litter though. Really? Yeah. It's just that some pigs are more dominant than others and the ones that are more pushy will get more food. Oh, so, so they keep getting bigger. Yes, and the other ones will stay small because they can't get as much food. Now this one here, these are bigger. Do they have names? No, no names. <laughs> if we name them, then we get attached to them and they'll be butchered anyway. So. That's good. That would be harder, wouldn't it? So do you do anything to, to try to help the smaller ones get enough to eat? No. In the end, sometimes we separate them again if we have enough rooms, but generally there's not enough rooms for all the different pigs to be separated, so they just have to stay together and then do the best they can. And then they'll be shipped at different times too. We weigh them regularly to see how much, um, to see which ones are ready to be shipped. And then the other ones, of course, will stay here. And then when more room gets freed up, then we can move them around too. Here. Holy cow, now that's a big pig. Yeah, that's the mother sow. And then those piglets have been. So born these so all these piglets belong to her? How many how big a litter does a pig have? It really varies. It's really nicer if it's a smaller number. Um, like thirteen is nice it's a good size but sometimes they can have over 20 piglets and that can be a problem just because they can't all get enough food to eat and um, also if there's too many then they're just, yeah, more likely to that one of them will die so there's about eight or nine here huh maybe I think there's more than that. ten well there's ten that i can see mm -hmm. <clears throat> now the mother's kind of in a pickle here no, um, yeah, she's kept like that just so she can't move too freely because just her weight. Um, she could squash a few of them. That happens sometimes when they're really small. She accidentally rolls over and then crushes a piglet. So, so how long, is she like this all the time? Yeah, um, <clears throat> until, until she's moved back up to the um, upper pig pen where the mother sows are kept. So she stays until the piglets are big enough that they can kind of start eating on their own, okay. and then, um, yeah, the piglets are moved to the other Rachel bravely went to Japan just after the earthquake and the resulting devastating tsunami, and then the tragic meltdown at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. We asked her about the effects it has had on the area. Um, we have a Becquerel Center at ARI, so they have, um, they have a machine where they can measure exactly how much radiation is in the food and the soil. Sometimes it takes a while for them to get the official reading on the measurement, but um, they try to be very careful about that so that they can accurately 
report on the level of radiation that is here in this area. And there are certain things that seem to contain higher levels of radiation, like for example, ash from um, like wood that has been burned, also mushrooms and berries, things that sort of hold, like are more concentrated and so they hold more radiation as well. But um, for the most part, it seems that a lot of the food and even the soil are recovering very fast and have now come to a level that is considered safe, especially by the Japanese government, and is actually quite a bit lower than government standards. There was damage. Um, the, one of the pig pens has been condemned, and so they're going to begin rebuilding next spring, I think. And also, there was an old Koinonia main building, which also has been demolished recently, and still there's construction going on. And this new building has been built um, on an area where they've determined that it's safer to build. And there was also the main administrative building, which has been here at ARI since the very beginning. And that also was demolished and a new farm shop was built um, also in a different area too. So yeah, a lot of buildings have been um, affected by the earthquake. As we close the program, I would like to go back to Japan one more time, to the Asian Rural Institute, where Rachel and I said goodbye. Rachel, thank you for visiting with us on Brethren Voices. It's been wonderful to talk to you about your experiences and about your assignment at Asian Rural Institute. Thank you. Thank you for being with us on Brethren Voices. So this is Brent Carlson. This is Rachel Buller. Wishing you peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When he is king, all wars will cease. May his peace begin with me. I'm gonna beat my sword into a plow. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Christ is king in my life now. May his peace begin with me.